Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. This is Deep Cats Reactions, and my name's Greg, and I'm going to play some more Arlo Guthrie. <laughs> so, uh, this should be fun. This this song is called Thanks to the Narcs, and it's, uh, hopefully I can get away with playing all of it. It's ten minutes long, but, uh, you know, this is more in Arlo's normal bailiwick, I guess you could say. But he, uh, I don't know what year this is, you know, but it seems like it's, uh, you know, fairly old. So, let's go ahead and check it out. Uh, you know, Arlo's got a story to tell, so let's listen. Thank you. We've been on, uh, this tour is like a celebration. This actual show is the end of a tour for us. We've been on the road since back in uh, February. Huh. And uh, that's a long time. I don't know when you're watching this thing, if you're watching it on TV, but that's like most of the year ago. Anyway, so we've been on the road for a while, and we didn't get much time off, but a couple of times we got to stay in a few places for a while. And uh, one of the times I remember I was watching TV because I had the cable at the hotel, and we don't have it where I live. So I was looking at TV just to see what was on. And uh, I was watching C-SPAN uh, to see what the Congress looked like. Because, you know, you remember, you could, you could see that thing on TV now. So I was watching the Congress, and it was that, that time they were debating the war on drugs. And I found that interesting, because I wanted to know how it was going to affect me personally. You know, I mean, not, not sort of in that way, because I've been good for a long time, but I just wanted to know. And I figured the main difference in my life would be that there'd be, like, more narcs at the shows than ever before, you know? And uh, I figured that'd be a great thing, because it's something I've been waiting to tell them for all these years and just didn't have a chance to get so many in one place at one time. And, uh, cause most of them don't realize, especially like younger narcs don't realize that I got my start playing music over 20 years ago, mostly due to agents of the federal government. Cause when I, it's true. Cause when I started playing, when I started playing, I was playing in these little clubs and I was, I was the only one there. There was nobody coming to them, I was just playing at them. And I was saying weird things and I was not the only one, there were other people playing other empty clubs, and they were saying weird things, too. And it was about that time, the federal government said, let's go find out what those weird people were saying. And so they dressed some people up and disguised them as normal and sent them down to the club. And it was about that time, the state government started saying, look, there's people going to those clubs. Let's find out what's going on there. So they disguised some people and sent them down. And by the time we were done with the federal and the state and the local and the county and the city and all that, we was packing these little clubs from coast to coast. And pretty soon, this is true, pretty soon tour buses was coming down filled with people saying, my God, there must be something going on over there. Let's go see what it is. And TV executives and record company presidents started coming, coming down, signing up everything they played. And I got swept up along with the rest of them. And I'm still here 20 years later. And I, I want to say thank you to those guys who had to come down years ago. I know there might be a few of you out here in this audience today. I know you can't be going like this, but hey, it's good to see you out there. And I know it's hard to be a narc, especially today, because, well, people don't realize the work that goes into, like, being a narc. It's not something, it, you, people don't realize the talent and ability you got to have. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not like, you don't just get out of high school and say, well, should I go to college or be a narc? <laughs> you can't do that. You got to have talents and abilities to start when you're a little baby. It's got to be nurtured and grown right. I mean, maybe, maybe, well, most kids lose those abilities around five or six years old. But in certain cases, when it's grown right, when people is taken care of right, those abilities can linger into adulthood. Maybe it's easier today with special ed and stuff, but these guys didn't have that back then. You know what I'm talking about? These guys had to develop powers and abilities on their own. And I know that, you know, when you think of people with powers, you, and you, you'd be thinking of some yogi sitting in a cave in India or something, but, hey, I know people right here in America that's got powers some of you guys wouldn't believe. Because I met a guy one time, and this guy, this was a little while ago, but I met him, and they used to stick this guy on airport runways, and he would smell airplanes as they was coming in for landing. <laughs> this is before they knew about dogs. It's true. <laughs> Not only could he pick out the plane, but he could pick out the seat. He would radio into the guys at the gate saying, there's a man in 36 C, he's carrying some illegal substance. And then they'd pick up that poor guy at the gate and he'd be wondering how they knew. 
I know, I could feel you sitting out there saying, boy, that is the stupidest thing that guy's ever said. What does he know what he's talking I know what I'm talking about. Because one time, I was sitting on an airplane in seat 36C. I was coming into America from a foreign land, and I had what we used to call illegal substance on my person. I didn't mean to have it. It was just, it was just so cheap over there, I couldn't help it. No. And everything was fine until I got on the plane, and the plane took off, and I suddenly realized, wait a minute, I can't get out of this plane. <laughs> and not only that, I was sitting in the no-smoking section. So I knew I was in trouble. And I had what we used to call inspiration, but we don't call it that today. We call it, I don't know, paranoia, something like that. And uh, back then, we used to call feelings like that inspiration, remember? And not only that, I was feeling, it was more than, it was like revelation, because I could see stuff. I was looking out the window of my plane, and I could see that man smelling my plane. And I was a thousand miles away from America. But I could see him as plain as day. And so, in a desperate fit of inspiration, not knowing what else to do, I ate it. And there I was, sitting in seat 36C. D, E, and F. I was floating around the plane. But it was okay. Because I, I knew I had powers. I could feel the powers coming into my being. As a matter of fact, I saved everybody's life one time. Because it's true, the plane was going down. And I just put my hand up, I thought, up. <laughs> and that plane went, nah. I saved everybody. I didn't even have to say nothing. They all knew it was me that saved them. They was all looking at me. <laughs> I remember, I remember when the plane landed. Because the time tunnel come to meet me. I remember it was attached to the building and it came out like that. And it attached itself on the plane. And people were, people, people were disappearing into the time tunnel. And I thought, boy, these people were stupid. <laughs> I was the last one on the plane. And I finally was escorted personally into the time tunnel. I remember I was about halfway through the time tunnel. When all of a sudden, standing right in front of me in the time tunnel, standing right in front of, was the same man. The same man that I had seen in my revelation smelling my plane a thousand miles away was now standing right in front of me in the time tunnel and he had a look in his eye that said I know you ate it <laughs> but it was okay because I had a look in my eye too that said yep <laughs> London from over the pole, flying in a big airliner, chicken flying everywhere around the plane. Could we ever feel much finer? Coming into Los Angeles, bringing in a couple of keys. Don't touch my bags if you please, Mr. Customs Man. There's a man with his ticket to Mexico. Strange. 
running from over the phone, flying in a big airliner. Chicken flying every way around the plane. Could we ever feel much better? Coming into Los Angeles, bringing in a cup of tea. Don't touch my bags if you please, Mr. Customs. Well, that was great, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. That was really typical Arlo. Although, you know, he did have a full band behind him, and they were really good. That guitar was hot, definitely. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> the song was almost superfluous. You know, I really enjoyed it. Don't get me wrong. The song was great, but the story <laughs> was, I mean, that was, uh, that was Arlo's deal, you know, was telling stories. He was really good at it. And that was, that was pretty friggin' hilarious. I don't know. I don't know if y'all have seen Woodstock, you know, or his performance uh, in Woodstock or when he's talking, but it was, it was so hilarious because he was so stoned. I mean, just so stoned. And it was very entertaining. I've got, I, I think I've got one of the videos up here of Arlo at Woodstock. I don't know. I can't remember. I've got... I've got so many videos up here, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. But I try to keep as many as many videos up here as I've got uh, subscribers. So you know that's a good that's a good rule of thumb. I think is to have as many videos as I do subscribers. So <laughs> I guess I better get to it. I'm a little bit below my uh, my quota there. So anyway, I hope you guys like that, and I'll be back and. Uh, Hit like, subscribe, and all that shit, so we'll see you then. Bye-bye.